Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the narratives and genres and of television panel, which is the last one of the day. Um, thank you, first of all, to Elka and Hannah and everyone involved in organising this slow conference. I think it's been a really terrific thing and, uh, and a very innovative way of uh, responding to the restrictions we've all been working under recently. Um, the structure of today's session will follow that of other panels. There will be two speakers, uh, not three as originally billed. Unfortunately, Emily Walker has had to withdraw due to ill health. Um, and our second speaker um, is, well, our first speaker is Michael Clark. Hello, Michael. And our second speaker, uh, Wu Zhang, is not yet with us, but we're hoping that as the session progresses, that she will join us. Um, the protocol is, uh, you, well, you're all observing it right now, is to that you, whilst uh, speakers are talking and presenting, um, please turn off your camera and mute your microphone. Um, and then please turn the cameras back on uh, when we finished and we do the Q and A. Um, if you want to, if you have a question um, when we finish, please do raise your hand and hopefully I'll spot you. I'm not very good at this, I warn you now, but I'll do my best. And if you want to use the chat facility, um, then please do so. Uh, it's being monitored by Matty, who will keep me posted if, if necessary. OK, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Michael. Michael Clark is a PhD student at the University of Kent, where he researches the problems that long running mutable television fictions pose to traditional notions of aesthetic appreciation. And he's going to talk about uh, The Simpsons. His talk is called I Want to Talk About The Simpsons, but do not know how. So with that intriguing title, I'll hand you over to Michael. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Stephen. And uh, thank you for everyone in attendance as well for your time. I guess in advance. OK, just sharing screen. And hopefully you can all see this. I will also just turn my camera off to preserve bandwidth. OK, so yes, as uh, Stephen said, uh, the title of this paper is I want to talk about The Simpsons, but don't know how. And this title, I hope, evokes the tone of this paper which is exploratory, uh, dialogic, and basically auto-ethnographic. Yeah, auto it's also metacritical in nature, as I want to discuss here a simple, uh, but I hope conceptually interesting challenge that I've encountered when trying to write evaluative, ev yeah, evaluative aesthetic criticism of a long-running incoherent television narrative about which I am highly ambivalent. In foregrounding evaluation in this way, I'm consciously aligning myself with the growing research project of television aesthetics, but while I acknowledge that this position is not uncontroversial within television studies, I don't claim to be doing anything provocative or radical here. Instead, I wish to speak honestly to and nuance slightly still unsettled notions of evaluation, which have persistently bothered television studies over the last few decades. And indeed, these notions have come, come up a few times uh, throughout this conference already, which puts this paper very much in conversation with uh, James Walters and Rob Watts's papers uh, at the beginning of the conference, alongside the quality television panel uh, on Monday. I will also note at the top here that this paper is adapted from a chapter written for the forthcoming Moments in Television Substance and Style collection, edited by Jonathan Bignall and Sarah Cardwell, which I believe is due uh, next year. OK, so. Are we going? There we are. OK, so as I intend this to be more discursive in nature, I've organised this question, sorry, this paper around some broad questions that should help me elaborate on the challenges at hand. And these are as follows. What is The Simpsons? Why do I want to talk about it? How can this be done? And so what? Which is where I lead out from the specific issues that I raise here and try to tease out some broader implications of this discussion. OK, so the first of these questions, what is The Simpsons, uh, seems like a fairly obvious one. But I'd still like to clarify precisely my object of inquiry here because The Simpsons as a title refers to at least two things. The first of these is the ginormous multimedia, multi-billion dollar franchise that encompasses 
original shorts from the Tracy Allman show and later shorts made in the last 10 years. Um, the Simpsons movie, the series, of course. Um, the Simpsons hit and run video games and, and others and books and literature and all attendant merchandise and paraphernalia and, and so on. And then the second thing the Simpsons refer to refers to is, of course, the program itself. This, now, this is a vast and incredibly long running program that has, since it debuted on Fox in 1989, broken all sorts of records regarding its longevity and particularly in the context of the United States, as you can see here. It's also been subject to widespread critical acclaim. Of course, it's still in production. It will in September uh, begin its 33rd season and already has a 34th season on order, keeping it on the air until 2023. It's on track to beat Last of the Summer Wine to become the longest running sitcom in terms of year on the year. And as you can see, it already has that accolade in terms of episodes produced. Although it's still some ways off becoming the longest running animated program ever, as the German uh, children's show uh, Sand Mansion has clocked in over 22,000 episodes since 1959. Now, however, now the uh, Simpsons franchise constitutes a major part of Disney's portfolio following its acquisition of Fox in 2019, and the program serves as a crucial selling point of Disney Plus globally. There's every chance that new seasons will be ordered in perpetuity, allowing The Simpsons to perhaps surpass even that record, because of course, the mouse always wins. Now, all of this is to say that while these two things we refer to as The Simpsons are inextricably linked, as the program is a central part of the franchise and the franchise a huge part of what's kept the program on the air, my object of inquiry here is the program as such, an exceptionally vast individual artwork. And to clarify, I use artwork here in a purely descriptive and not honorific sense. OK. But why? To what end do I want to talk about The Simpsons? Well, there are two answers to this question. First, I would argue that there's a gap in the literature. Now, this might sound absurd to those of you familiar with this literature, because, of course, a fair amount of work has been published about The Simpsons. However, scouting out this work reveals the majority of these studies come from other disciplines, as you can see on, on the slide here. This makes sense, being a hugely popular program that depicts and satirizes various facets of American cultural, political and family life, and has done so for such a prolonged period, The Simpsons intersects with many areas of research. However, generally speaking, these studies are interested in The Simpsons only to the point that it offers an accessible entry point into other matters. And really, that's not what I'm so interested in myself. So what about television studies? Well, as you can see here, there's been five books published, which is not an insubstantial amount. Uh, in terms of articles, uh, Critical Science in Television has published only one article that engages extensively with The Simpsons uh, by Joel Gwynn, which also considers King of the Hill. King of the Hill. Elsewhere, uh, Jason Mittal, Simone Knox, uh, Jonathan Gray, uh, M.E.M. Davis, Gemma Gilboy, James Zabrowski, and Greg Shars have already written about it as well. So even, even when just focusing on work from television studies, we're still left with a lot of writing about a lot of show, and this overview does not encompass everything either. So now The Simpsons has not been embraced as enthusiastically within television studies as some dramatic serialised programmes. It's nevertheless attracted a not insubstantial amount of interest, especially for an episodic animated comedy. So given what I've just explained here, this begs the supplementary question of, well, what gap are you talking about here? What more could possibly be said? Well, within television studies, we can broadly distinguish between works that, like non-television studies work, consider The Simpsons as a cultural artifact that can speak to various facets of American culture. And then a much smaller group of works that focus on The Simpsons' com comedic strategies and usually satirical or postmodern functions. And this very much what uh, aligns with what Jason Mittal in Complex Television um, has written about in terms of uh, television studies being historically preoccupied with questions along the lines of what does this program mean and why does it matter? And so what is being canvassed in much of this scholarship is what The Simpsons can tell us, what it can teach us and how it has functioned within particular historical and industrial contexts. And these questions are, of course, important and necessary. And that they are after The Simpsons suggests that, albeit with a strong degree of distance, The Simpsons is considered to be highly valued work. 
Now, there are, of course, many kinds of value. And what these studies suggest is that The Simpsons is loaded with cultural, political, epistemic and historical value. But my question is, what of aesthetic value? What about The Simpsons as an artwork? One of scholarship that asks, to borrow Mittel's phrasing again, how does it mean and how does it matter? And indeed, how does it work well? Uh, as alluded, alluded to previously, this work is much more limited and uh, mostly to aspects of comedic theory. And this is understandable. Asking questions along these lines directly has often been considered at best trivial, if not ideologically suspect, for assuming inherent notions of artistic value and enforcing particular taste cultures and cultural hierarchies. And these are, of course, very vital considerations. But nevertheless, these are the questions I want to ask, these how questions. I enjoy them and find them interesting as someone who loves digging into television as a unique artistic medium. And I think when asking them sensitively and honestly, we do not worry about notions of enforcing cultural power. I subscribe to the notion of aesthetic criticism as a kind of travelogue through the myriad possibilities of television as an artistic medium, an invitation to see a program how an author sees it. It is an expressive, sorry, it is an expressive and persuasive practice rather than a demonstrative one. And of course, it accepts that a reader can be left unpersuaded. And moreover, as uh, Jason Jacobs has argued, uh, these various travelogues of various experience in television might contribute to a more robust and pluralistic understanding of the television medium and its potentialities. Now, of course, I don't think I'm saying much new here. The state of play within television studies has changed gradually over the last couple of decades, with television aesthetics growing into a more established subfield, where arguments along the lines of how do these things work uh, are being made more frequently. Um, however, The Simpsons, despite its critical and commercial success, has been largely overlooked within this aesthetic and evaluative turn in television studies. Therefore, I think there's a contribution to be made. Now, this desire to contribute brings me to the second and perhaps more pertinent reason why I want to talk about The Simpsons. I like it and I want to appreciate its many achievements. Now, uh, for the interest of time, I will limit this part of my discussion as I could go on forever here. And this paper is more concerned with uh, method methodological questions. Um, I just wish to explain here my motivations in terms of my positionality in relation to the work. However, I've sketched some reasons on the PowerPoint and I will stress these are just merely sketches. These aren't substantive claims. Um, but the gist is that it's, it's a rich and I would say unfathomably imaginative work, a generously entertaining one. And as the various studies I alluded to previously suggest, one has a lot to say about the messy, bus the messy business of being alive. So to put it plainly, when asked, as we television scholars inevitably are, about my favourite programme, I'll say it's The Simpsons. And now with this, I don't mean to impose any universal criteria, like these uh, reasons I've sketched out and by no means a universal criteria, or I don't mean to posit The Simpsons as quality television. I've been trying to consciously avoid that term because I find it too loaded and not of much use analytically in this context. Uh, what I mean to say is that, uh, to use Sarah Cardwell's distinction, uh, I take The Simpsons to be good television, or more precisely, good television comedy, which I experience positively for the reasons canvassed here and more. And yeah, I, and, and on the more, I mean, this is where I'm particularly missing the post-conference bar experience because this would be a good bar chat anyway. OK, so now I've established what it is I want to talk about and why. The question then becomes one of how I might go about this. How might I discuss the how of The Simpsons? Now, a broadly accepted method for this that again we'll briefly sketch here in the interest of time involves attending to aspects of form and narrative via moments which is something that James Waters uh, discussed in his paper at the conference. Now this isn't necessarily a vague unit of appreciation that's in the eye of the beholder. It could be a, a shot, a scene, something within a scene, it could be whatever you make of it. But the intention is that it can magnify or bring it to sharp relief or somehow represent a particular aspect of the whole programme. This has been elaborated by uh, Jason Jacobs and Stephen Peacock in Television Aesthetics and Style and recently reaffirmed by um, Ariane Houdelet uh, for In Media. And there's also, as I mentioned at the top here, um, a series coming from Manchester University Press dedicated to the analysis of television moments. 
Now, usually this attention to moments is underpinned by a kind of Bordwellian historical poetics and sometimes in, in tandem with a functional theory of style as advanced by Noel Carroll. Now, these approaches combined strive to understand a work's formal choices and features as guided by broadly constituted and historically situated creative intentions. And this is some, uh, these two methods have been uh, combined and imported from film studies by uh, Jeremy Butler in his television style. Now, of course, this is just a very rough sketch and it's also nothing new. It's just to say, say that discussing the how of The Simpsons sensitively and appropriately would evolve evaluating The Simpsons on its own aesthetic terms. Now, however, this is where we get to the big but. I think we need to speak more about aesthetic terms and the Simpsons aesthetic terms. Because when we talk about the aesthetic terms of the Simpsons or the style of the Simpsons or the narrative strategies of the Simpsons, this assumes, I think, a degree of stability and unity that I honestly don't find in the Simpsons. To speak of the Simpsons, to my mind, is to address the whole work. And now, as noted previously, The Simpsons is a remarkably long running show and has undergone substantial aesthetic changes since it began in 1989. And this is in response to its longevity. So I'd say season one is very different to season five in its style of storytelling. And, uh, and as is season five to series 10 and so on. As a whole, it's a program, I would argue, marked above all by incoherence. And it is with this acknowledgement that I should confess that I've not been entirely honest in my appraisal of The Simpsons so far. While I do indeed describe it as my favourite programme, I always caveat this by clarifying that I don't really mean the whole thing. I mean, really, seasons one to eight of The Simpsons, which bear more consistently the qualities I sketched earlier. In fact, I wouldn't really argue that The Simpsons as a whole is good television. Now, parts of it certainly are, but The Simpsons has changed and my experiences of it have changed in kind becoming increasingly negative beginning around season nine. Now, again, for the interest of time, I will not concern myself with the real reasons for this. Again, that's more bar chat, I would say. Uh, and I'm more interested here, interested in this paper, in what to do with this belief when it exists. Um, but I will note here that there are broad shifts in style, and sto style, storytelling and tone motivated by changes in showrunners. It's had uh, eight sets of showrunners over the years. And in the writing room, as it's credited over 150 writers at this no 130 writers at this point and there's also the fact of simple creative exhaustion as it has been going for 700 episodes now there's only so many situations you can depict um as south park once made a gag of the simpsons already did it and that was in 2001 okay so in short i don't really find newer episodes of the simpsons nearly as funny imaginative ambitious heartfelt or as entertaining I actually find them kind of sad in, the, in their mediocrity. And so my problem is this. My amb ambivalent experience of, of this mutable, expansive and disunified work seems to preclude any straightforward appreciation of The Simpsons via representative moments. Uh, the seemingly innocent evaluative statements I might attach to a moment from The Simpsons cannot, e cannot give even a slight impression of the whole and my experience of it. So for example here, I would say that is The Simpsons funny is a complicated question. Um, however, where television aesthetics is concerned, a program is usually considered as a stable individual artwork that's broken into parts of which the critic gives an overview. This approach has its benefits and is certainly pragmatic, but I think it can risk overlooking serial production that is dispersed over years and potentially decades. And the changes this, this might bring about in the program as an artwork, its formal and stylistic um, and storytelling features, and the challenges this might pose to our critical practices. And so I guess to tease out this problem a bit more, I wonder if it's worth perhaps reformulating the program conceptually, not as a whole artwork, as Ted Tenicelli does, but as an artwork that is con continually constituted by smaller artworks that are complete and appreciable in themselves, namely seasons and episodes, which will be created at different times in the program's history and therefore could have their own aesthetic terms, their own style, their own narrative strategies that pull the program in different directions as its temporal boundaries grow over time. In other words, we might say that programs are not the only artworks we engage with in television. So again, I 
don't think I'm saying anything particularly novel here, because others have, of course, remarked upon the uncertainty of the serial critic, such as, again, Jason Mittal and Stephen Peacock and Jason Jacobs. Um, but I would say they've only remarked upon it, offering no clear answers. Moreover, they've raised these issues in the context of provisional claims made while a program is in production, incomplete and in flux. Now, though The Simpsons is in production still, um, this is incidental to my problem because where The Simpsons might go to me is less important than where than where it is already gone and how this has affected my evaluation. And Mittal has also interestingly approached the notion of critical devaluation, um, but only in terms of a program that he doesn't like, which is Mad Men. Um, but what if what you like and what you don't like are technically one and the same? That question isn't so clear and hasn't been addressed yet. Now, granted, this has been covered in fan studies by Henry Jenkins about Beauty and the Beast, Anna McKee about Doctor Who, Rebecca Williams about well, all sorts, but mostly the West Wing, and Paul Booth, um, just in a general sense, among others. But of course, this comes with, with an observational distance, whereas I'm more interested uh, in this notion of falling out of love with a show in terms of what it might mean for a critical practice premised on evaluation. Now, to my mind, fan studies and television aesthetics can be construed as two sides of the same coin, involving themselves in knotty questions of how people can and do engage with television artworks. The former takes an external point of view, whereas the latter an internal one. And it is a shame then that television aesthetics, when trying to build a medium profile through criticism, has not really followed fan studies in addressing this more contingent and provisional and mutable form of evaluation. Now, instead, it is largely disregarded what I argue is this fundamental aspect of engaging with and appreciating television artworks, this potential for change and a falling out of love with the programme. I mean, I'm sure this is something that everybody in the room and watching on YouTube has experienced. We've all fallen out of love with or been disappointed by or just fallen away from a programme. Thus, despite its devotion to issues of judgment and value to repurpose the name of uh, Jason Jacobs' famous contribution to the field, television aesthetics has still quite a polarised understanding of value where things are good or they're bad, which I think might hold it back. And incidentally, this is something that Paul Booth has argued of fan studies. Now, I realise I'm near the end of my time here. And so by way of conclusion, I just want to quickly reflect on the options that seem available to me at the moment within the state of play and then just make a quick modest proposal. Now, I could just disregard these changes and write about The Simpsons anyway. Um, and this is a strategy that I will say some people have taken, it seems. If you look at the episodes they're selecting and the moments, they tend to be in that season one to eight bracket. However, if we're striving for an honest and reflective critical practice here, this is undesirable as it would be misrepresent, misrepresenting the whole work as I've experienced it. OK, well, instead, then I could accept that The Simpsons is simply too unwieldy an object of appreciation and focus instead on other programmes. But that would be a shame. To my mind, the achievements of The Simpsons earlier seasons are still achievements in the art of television, irrespective of the programme's later decline. Why should they go under, unappreciated? Or to make this modest proposal that I've teased, I could at least be honest about this in my critical travel log. I could move beyond the programme as a whole and draw the limits of my journey more clearly, same even explicitly, what my object, sorry, even more explicitly, what the object of my inquiry is, and that I don't really want to talk about The Simpsons. Now my journey ends with season, season nine. And to my mind, this would still contribute to the research project of television aesthetics by granting attention to fundamental aspects of how television artworks are made over time and how we engage with and evaluate them also over time. And this could open up works that might otherwise be disregarded by television aesthetics, like The Simpsons, as attention has until this point usually been paid to serialised work that seem to exhibit a strong degree of coherence or unity. And this in turn would create a, a richer, more diverse reflection of the messy thing that we call television. And that's it. It's an ending. That's enough. That's great. Thank you very much, Michael. That's, that's, that's really lovely. And it's a great ending. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Oh, can you see me? Um, right. I'm very pleased to say that Yu Zhang has joined us. And um, 
so I'm going to go over to her now and uh, introduce her and we'll take her paper and then we'll return to questions at the end. OK, hello, you, are you there? Y you, Yu Zhang, are you Sorry. there? Sorry. Yeah, are you, you there? Me? Yeah. Yes, I can I'm hear here. Yes, we can, we can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay, um, I'm just going to share the screen with you. Great, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to meet you. And, and uh, um, I'm sorry you've been having problems joining us this afternoon, but it's uh, <laughs> yeah. great that you, you resolve those and that you are with us now. That's good. <laughs> um, we, are, we are still seeing Michael's screen. We are, oh, yeah. yeah. Are we still saying, oh, my, uh, yes, we'll need yes, to move that. Thank oh, you. thank you, Christine. Yes. Ooh, yeah, uh, sorry about that. Yeah, that's gone now. Good. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, Yu Zhang is an assistant professor of media and communication at Shanghai University. Uh, uh, she received her doctoral degree from the University of Westminster in London. And her current research interests lie in the area areas of international communication, reception of cinema, television, and digital journalism. Um, you, you is going to talk to us today about uh, cultural homogenization or narrative transparency? Question mark. A case study of the dating show in East Africa. Hello, Mr. Wright. What a great title yeah. for a data. Uh, I, I, I still have this technical problem that I have to ask for help, but that I couldn't share my PPT, the, the slides okay. with you. I don't know what is happening here. OK, let's uh, do we have um, and some technical assistants who might be able to offer you some. Um, some some support or advice. So I, I clicked the button to share the screen and uh, there are some options there, but uh, there is no PowerPoint. I don't know. Is this because um, the, it's a Mac system? So did you uh, press the, sorry, press the upwards arrow in the little white box in the top yeah. right hand? Yeah. And yeah, what, yeah. Are the, what are the options that you're seeing? Uh, I'm seeing um, the Microsoft team chat and uh, the, a PDF of Crystal Studies in, in television, the program, and that's so it. You're not but seeing, I still have, yeah, no. You're not seeing a win, window on the right hand side of that? Yeah, I saw the window. Uh, there's only like yeah. a, those two options. One is in the macro team chat, another is the PDF. Okay, and the, you don't have your PowerPoint open. I mean, I assume you have your PowerPoint open already. Yeah, yes, it's, it's open cool. already. Okay. Right, what I'm going to suggest is that you email it to me and I'll share it. OK, sure. Uh, I send you uh, um, an earlier version. I changed it a little bit. I'm just going to send you the updated okay. one. Apologies, everyone, for the hitch. <laughs> These That's things right. happen online, don't they? <laughs> Sorry. They do indeed. There's bound to be one problem, so don't worry. It's loading, it takes a few seconds. While we're waiting, I will go ahead and share the program that I fell out of love with vis-a-vis um, <laughs> -vis my um, uh, Michael's paper. It was Dexter and it was a very, very swift falling out of love. It was like a very bitter and acrimonious <laughs> breakup <laughs> with that program. <laughs> Was it just like a like an episode that just it was, turned it you was on some, it? It was something that I can't actually tell you about because it would be a horrible spoiler for the ah. series if anybody who hasn't seen it but if you do know the series I'm sure you'll know the moment that I'm talking about and that was it for me okay yeah it's done yeah okay I believe so, yeah, although I don't really understand why or how. Money. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I'm not getting anything yet, but I'm sure it will come through. 
anybody in the chat want to be brave and share their fallings out of love with the programme while we're waiting? Indeed. Maybe it's just me. Lost. I fell lost. out of love with Lost. Oh, it was awful. I really wanted it to be so much better than it was, but the writers strike. Uh, yeah, it was just awful. And the ending. Oh. <laughs> it was the same with Heroes, also oh, dis heroes. destroyed by the by the writers' strike. Had that first very good season, and then it was amazing. It was. I, I still watched it till the end. I don't know why. Yeah, I, <laughs> I guess I it's some cost fallacy. And and just muttered to myself, this should have been so much better than it is. <laughs> <laughs> Such a strong yeah. premise, but heroes. Yeah. God. Uh, no. But you still, yeah, you still have the good times with with both, though. Yeah. Ah. Okay. What have we got here? All right. We might be getting somewhere. Hold on. That's mm -hmm. good. I just yeah, send okay. another one uh, through Gmail. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> right. I'm hoping this one's going to work then. Okay. So, hopefully I'm not going to make a bad show now by not being able to share it myself. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so you should be able to see. Yeah. You can see Wonderful. it? Thank you so much. Okay, hold on. I need to work out how to mute my mic. <laughs> okay, um, it's, it's all yours, you. Okay. No, 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 sorry. No? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, off you go. Okay. Sorry. Oh, do cool. tell me when to um, switch the slides, though. Sure. I would just say next. Is that yes, all right? Brilliant. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you very much for having me here, and uh, I'd like to express my gratitude for Alc. She has just done a wonderful job by organising everything and putting us together. Uh, so my presentation today is about um, an ongoing um, project of mine on a television dating show called Hello Miss Dwight, which is mostly broadcast in the areas of Eastern Africa. So this show is produced by a Chinese company called Star Times, but his original format was from Australia. So this show has been adapted and changed to cater to uh, different local audiences in different countries for many years. Um, and my research objective is to find out how the show is, you know, localized in Africa by the Chinese producers. Uh, I'm literally just starting the project, so it is still in a very, very initial stage. And I would really appreciate any comments or advice or recommendation of references. Um, next. Next, thank you. Yeah, so here's the major contents of the of this presentation. I will start with the different versions of the dating show in Australia, China and in Kenya. And I prepare, uh, I prepared three uh, video clips from YouTube. And I just want to show a very small part of them to give you a um, general idea about the difference between the three different versions. And then I'm going to briefly introduce the Chinese company that produced the African version and talk about the changes they made for the African audiences uh, in comparison with the Chinese one. And finally, I would like to discuss with you the theoretical framework uh, that I think it will work for this research and the questions that I'm expecting to answer. Next. So the original format of the show in Australia is called uh, uh, Take Out. Um, the British version is called Take Me Out, which I believe that everyone here is quite familiar with. So shall we just have a look at the opening and the part with the male guest introduce himself uh, through video and the final part about the, how the matching works. So uh, how, how should we... Um, uh, maneuver this because um, uh, the introduction is between 150 to 220, 26, and that introduction is, yeah. I'm just going to tap it in the chat.
Uh, can you guys hear the video? Because I can't. Oh, sorry. I didn't I'm have... sorry, we can't hear a thing. Sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't know. Um, okay, because I can. Um, well, you missed somebody being very rude about their brother. <laughs> um, <laughs> you did um, miss a lot. <laughs> oh, goodness me, what have I done? Is this now? It's lights off. Yeah. Yeah, it's on now. I'm so sorry, you. It's okay, it's okay, it's fine. Just a, a very brief. All right, Alex, of the 10 ladies that were in the game, let's see how many are left. Pretty good stuff. Three said no, seven said yes. Running at 70% there, yeah, that's pretty, pretty solid. Feeling good? Yeah, no, that is good. Not sweating under that man cardigan yet? Yeah. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. All right, I'm going to talk to, have we got Brooke? You've done a runner on us. Shall we just to jump to the final part to start at uh, 30 minutes, 29 seconds to have a look at the matching part? I'm sorry, I got a message on... Uh, I can't hear it. Yeah, I got a message on Teams saying they were going to stop sharing my audio, and I don't know why it's done that. Would you like to take Palatina on a date tonight? Of course, definitely will. Uh, Palatina, come on up. Why does it keep doing this? Right. We got one. We got a date. This is beautiful. So how are you feeling? You've uh, you bagged him in the end. <laughs> yes, you got one. Good stuff. Pretty stoked, Alex. I am. Excellent. Looking forward to tonight. All right, we're going to uh, ship you guys off to have a beautiful evening together. Head up the stairs and uh, get stuck into your night. Thank you, Alex Palatina. You seem fun, but like a really outgoing, outdoorsy girl. This guy's cool, so yeah, I've kind of got a catch here. I'm expecting the date to be a bit awkward, but I'm sure we'll get over it and have fun. Yeah, I'm really keen to go out on a date with Alex and to see a bit more about him and see if he talks a bit more. I definitely don't kiss girls on the first date, and Palatina won't be an exception to this. Yeah, I'd kiss him. <laughs> yeah. Very hard to know. How yeah, I think. Yeah, we can just uh, stop here. Yeah. Great. So the next slide, please. But you can't really tell. So Alex got a date. Let's see how the Chinese guy is doing. So the um, Chinese version, it came into China about two years after the original show in uh, Australia started. I remember when the show first came out um, in 2010, I was a junior in the college and it was like a huge thing in China um, because um, dating or matching has never been televised in such an entertaining and a con controversial way before. Um, there are also some very apparent changes made in this version. So let's just have a look at it. I'm just going to tap the, the, uh, the, the, the time period that I think you, uh, that I want to show, show you guys. Is that all right in the chat? I can't see the chat. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh, just tell me, right. okay. tell me. Tell me. So the, it's about the the first um, first two minutes, and then start from the uh, uh, five minutes to six uh, six to thirty six. Okay. And the final part uh, starts from like eleven. Hey, 
迎收看大型生活服务类节目《步步高》，vivo 智能手机非诚勿扰。大家好，我是孟非，欢迎你们，欢迎各位来到现场，欢迎乐嘉老师、黄灿老师。好，有请今晚二十四位美丽的单身女生。四位女生，欢迎你们，请亮灯。我们的奖励规定是，男嘉宾第一轮亮相获得不少于二十二张亮灯牵手礼。嘉宾离开之后，都将获得由营养加大、幸福变大的娃哈哈营养快线提供的爱心海之旅，同时他们还将获得由蓝月亮手洗专用洗衣液提供的洁净大礼包。没有牵手成功的男嘉宾还可以和飘柔爱转角的二十四位女生擦出爱的火花。各位做好准备，开始我们今天的节目，有请。一号男嘉宾。Can you feel it? Can you feel it? 大家好，我是水清，我要回来了。呃，三位老师好，现场的观众朋友们。后来。Was it about five minutes? Yeah. 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 我跟庆瑶一直都有联系，我就会告诉他我又去到哪哪哪。他也非常有爱心，在前一段时间，他专门到了四川的一些贫困地区去帮助那边的孩子们。我去了一趟四川凉山州一个马都村小学，我组织了一次我们舞蹈圈的捐衣服，捐到这个地方，走了八个小时的山路，我一路颠簸。我可以不用练腹肌了，我的腹肌一直就是这样 hold 住的。但我过去之后，其实让我自己感觉很震撼。他们那边没有厨房，很。六号刘登表明他愿意跟你走，如果你愿意过去牵他手，从这儿离开；如果不愿意，表示感谢之后你自己走。想清楚告诉我们决定。愿意，恭喜你想，我以后如果去到山区的话，其实是很艰苦的，所以我在想，您有没有真的做好这方面的准备？你有这种勇气，愿意去陪着我去去到这些地方，说明呃，你骨子里面也是很善良。上一次呢是以坚持了我的心动女生，然后以失败而告终，这一次终于签好成功了，所以呢，我还心里是很平安。Yeah, that's about it. 上次有个。Next slide, please. So, um, uh, the Chinese guy ended up with a date too. So the Chinese version tends to make things more serious, as you can see, and it usually takes a lot of good qualities for the male guest to be picked, as we see in the example that this guy has to be like he is a dancer, he has like a fit body, and he has at least very high morality about、uh, giving charities to poor kids and everything. So,、um, and it's more than just picking an interesting guy to date.、Uh, both of them are considering. I think、um, they were thinking a lot about.、Uh, are you ready to? To、uh, help me with my charity career or stuff like that, and、uh, most of female guests、uh, are actually setting a very high standard to find out、uh, like a future husband. But the African version, which is、um, uh, the subject of my research, it is although produced by Chinese,、um, it seems quite relaxed. And does not carry so much social and moral responsibilities as the Chinese version does. So、um, let's have a look at the opening introduction in the final. So the 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 opening is in the first、um, one minute, 
and the introduction is from three minutes to uh, three thirty. <laughs> Welcome back to Hello, Mr. Wright, and I am Veracity. Of course, my name is Juan Aroni, Dr. Funeke. And of course, we are joined uh, from a previous episode. Uh, we had Evelyn, of course, she is back then. Like she didn't lose hope, she still wants to get her Mr. Wright, of course, hoping that this time you will get lucky, right? I'm hoping so. Thank you so much. Welcome to the show again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vera. Yes. Please take a walk. You ready? Yes. Mr. Wright? Yes. Bring it on. Okay, Mr. Wright is coming up in two, three, one. the neck just reduce the shit which is all day by the six and uh, the final part is from 12 minutes Took us for the break. Okay. So how are you feeling? Um, too too happy. I'm ecstatic. She's the one you wanted, right? Definitely. Oh, because I was just looking at you. Okay. That is amazing, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a very emotional. Um, as you can see, it's it's kind of like really tough. Um, so as they walk out of stage, let's give them a hand. right back after the break. So it looks like that everybody is getting date. So the clips we just watched are actually very small part, a small part of the show. Uh, we can notice that there are a lot of similarities in the formats, but also many differences. And uh, we'll come back to the differences between the Chinese and African versions later. Um, now, I'd like to briefly introduce the Chinese media company that uh, made the show. Um, it is a private media company, and the reason why I'm emphasizing it is because most Chinese media in Africa are state-run or state-owned. So, Star Times entered the African market in the year of 2000 and uh, became one of the largest players in the local media industries. And by the year of 2016, it has covered 13 sub-Saharan um, countries and had at least 39 market share in East Africa alone. Um, next, please. And uh, it is expanding its territory by carrying out, carrying out uh, the Chinese government's aid project of um, bringing digital media to 10,000 rural villages in Africa. And the project is um, almost coming to an end. Uh, which means that the start time is really spreading into almost every corner of the continent. But there are also some exceptions as well. As I was doing field research in Tanzania in 2019, they told me that Tanzania refused the aid. So, uh, sorry, next page. So the essential business of Star Times for now is still selling TV boxes with the paid content, including news, sports, and the dramas, it is actually increase, increasing the portion of the imported uh, Chinese content, such as movies, reality shows, and so on. And uh, Star Time is also producing its own media content. Um, next slide, please. 
And Hello, and Hello Mr. Light is one of its most eye-catching products. Apparently, the Chinese producers of Star Time try to rebuild the success of the Chinese version, which is called If You Are The One. And as we see from the video clips, they do bring many features from China. For example, their audiences in the studio and the female host to provide a different opinion. But there are also many pretty obvious differences. Uh, next. The dating show If You're the One in Chinese is much more than just dating. Its Chinese is called Fei Cheng Wu Rao, meaning do not disturb if not sincere. And uh, there is also a very popular saying in China that any relationship that does not aim at marriage is a joke. So the Chinese women are actually dead serious about dating and matching. So the show If You're the One is somehow engaged with a lot of uh, like cultural and social topics such as marriage freedom, uh, conjugal relations, gender inequality, and etc. Uh, it is one of the major reasons why it became so popular 10 years ago. Back then, uh, the reality show in China is not as developed as it is now, and um, there was no platform for people to discuss publicly about private matters such as marriage and intimate relations in an entertaining way. So if you're the one carries the social responsibilities to navigate public opinions. Next, please. And we know how cautious the Chinese government is when it comes to how the public thinks. So very soon after the show went viral, there was a professor from the party school, if we pay uh, closer attention to the video, we would notice that uh, there is a female uh, sitting by the stage. She plays the role of a psychological consultant, providing advice for the female guests. And uh, a lot of controversial female guests who were known as like gold diggers, they were removed from the show, although they were part of the major reason why the show went viral in the first place because um, apparently their presence violates the models the government tries to set before the Chinese women. Next page. Um, but when it comes to Kenya, Hello Mr. Right, as we can see from the video, it is a much more simplified version. Um, it has less guests and the matching procedures are much more easier. It does not has uh, it does not have all those fancy and overwhelming opening like if you were one. And it, to some extent, uh, has a lot of similarities with the original fam format from Australia, as it is just an entertaining TV program and without all those entanglements with the public opinion and government ideologies and stuff like that. Of course, its um, simplicity, um, we can say, has something to do with its limited budget. Um, next slide, please. But uh, it is um, still a very captivating TV show for the local audiences in Kenya. According to the Chinese media, the Chinese producers believe that the success of the Hala Mistrad is due to the relatively relaxed cultural value on intimate relations, which are no strings uh, attached. So the atmosphere of the show is much more like your average life with no prepared script or design, at least that's what they say. So next slide. So the Chinese production team clarified um, its limited participation and it claimed that they only provided technical support and gave the local partners the freedom to do whatever they find necessary. But still, there exists uh, some kind of semiotical or cultural connection between the Chinese and the African versions. So the name of the African version, Hello Mr. Right, um, seems to hint a female perspective uh, in terms of uh, finding the perfect guy for life. And uh, the clip we just watched has a title it says that uh, there was a female guest who was so heartbroken that he burst into tears and because she was not picked. And, and the logic behind all of these dramas and the settings make me wonder about the substance of the show. Um, next. So as the title of my presentation indicates, I'm considering doing my research in a relatively dialectal approach. Um, on one hand, it, is, it looks like a cultural domination as the format is penetrating different cultures in a rather homogenized way. But on the other hand, there were also significant changes being made to reflect the varied social characters of different countries. But um, 
Um, I haven't collected enough empirical findings to have a conclusive or hypothetical assumption. So I'm actually keeping an open mind about what I'm going to find in the following research. So next. And the two research questions that I want to address are, does the format, especially the Chinese one, propose a specific imagination about a romantic relationship? And does this imagination dominate the African version or is it resolved by the local culture? Next. Uh, so this is my basic idea about the risk topic and uh, here's the references for this presentation. And the last uh, slide, please. And uh, I, 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 like I said, I would be really grateful for any kind of comment uh, opinions on it. And thank you so much for listening to my rambling. And thank you so much for the technical help. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, you. That, that was really interesting and well done for plowing on through the technical difficulties. That uh, was fascinating. Thank you. Um, we, we're, we're now at the point where we can open up for discussion um, and quest and Q&A. So do we need? Yes, thank you. We brought Michael back. That's good. And Hannah, too. So do we have any questions? Uh, are there any? Christine. Christine? Uh, uh, I can see your face. Are you? Sorry, yes. I was just turning my camera on, really, but uh, I'll give it oh, a right, go okay. anyway. No, that's fine. Um, no, oh, that's fine. Good. They, they were both very fascinating papers, but I'm going to talk to Michael's um, because, I mean, what occurred to me as you were talking was that, well, there are, there's, there's one question, which is, do we just fall out of love with these programs basically because they become so familiar, we get used to their tropes and the characters don't perhaps develop in the way that we like, et cetera, et cetera. So is there a, an inbuilt entropy in long television shows? I think Roland Barthes once said about beginnings that, you know, once, once something has started, it's all downhill from there. And mm -hmm. I quite like that. Mm -hmm. Now, so that's one question. Is there, is there an inbuilt aesthetic problem to those long shows? Um, well, I suppose that is the problem, really. Or, or do we have your ver a version of aesthetics which depends so much on questions of st on, on, on the virtues of coherence, stability, openings, matching, closings, you know, resolution of problems, etc. that actually we haven't yet found a way of talking about television aesthetics for these very long dramas. Is it is the problem in the programmes or is it our problem that we as academic, you know, who, who want to do an aesthetic study of television programmes haven't found the means to do so? Yeah, so I'm just noting these down because I, otherwise I will forget. <laughs> Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for the questions. So the first one in terms of, you know, do we fall out of um, love because of familiarity? That that might have to be a kind of a piecemeal answer. It depends on, on the on the program, I suppose. Um, the, the curious thing about The Simpsons, um, which I didn't really mention in, in the presentation because there was a lot going on a lot to condense in there is that the Simpsons really I think for a lot of people and myself included didn't really become the Simpsons until around season two or three anyway you know it was it's sort of um a process of finding its voice and then it sort of settled on a voice but then it was sort of these, these consistent mod modulations I suppose uh, this thought especially as uh, early on it had uh, different showrunners every two years who had kind of different visions of what the show is and you can sort of see you know these various adjustments of expectations and what the show is doing in its formal strategies. Um, so I th whether it could continue doing that beyond a certain point is, is another question. I think that that's maybe more of a yeah. crea creative issue because um, I think especially for a family sitcom, even if it's sort of unbounded by 
um, you know, photographic representation, you know, because, because it's animated. Um, it's there are still only so many things you can do that are fresh and innovative. Um, I mean, this is something that also, I guess, one of the characteristics of especially those earliest seasons of The Simpsons is that it was so self-reflexive. And there, there's about four or five episodes around season eight and nine that comment on basically how the writers are sick of it um, <laughs> and how they're just um, completely done and how the show's changed and how they're not really enjoying it. Um, uh, the Itchy and Scratchy and Poochie show is basically that. It's, you know, they often use the Itchy and Scratchy show as um, to, a way of discussing writing for, about for television, basically, and the troubles of making a TV show. Um, uh, and yeah, so in terms of familiarity, I yeah, I I think again, The Simpsons because it is so long running, it is a unique example. But say if you look at something like Game of Thrones, which I was tempted to mention because of the sort of very vociferous reaction to that, that is more self-contained and serialized, and I don't think that was a problem of familiarity. And I think in most cases, people mm -hmm. wanted more of it. I think you know people were probably saying actually this could have done with two extra seasons rather than sort of condensed. So I think it, it very much depends on the show. Um, and to the question of unity and stability and whether this is our problem or whether it's the show's, uh, I'm more inclined to say it's our problem. Mm. Um, so this is something I'm sort of doing in my own research for, for my PhD. It's, I guess, tracking this intellectual history um, through uh, film studies where you obviously have a, a more discreet unit of appreciation and also philosoph philosophical aesthetics because uh, there does seem to be a sort of uh, a straight line almost, especially when you have people like Noel Carroll and David Bordwell, who D Bordwell isn't really a philosopher, but Noel Carroll is, you know, he did his film studies PhD, then got one in philosophy and he's mm. sort of been straddling the line since. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would argue, I mean, obviously television studies has its own traditions of especially semiotics and, and, and whatnot, but yeah, I, I would consider it more of a method methodological problem of, how we're appreciating these works and how unity is almost considered well just assumed to be an aesthetic virtue I, I, this is this kind of yeah. a rapidly answer but i don't know if that's you might want to look at older work on soaps yeah. perhaps where yes that can't be yeah you know because there is no prospect of closure you can't sure. have unity as a value yeah but thank you although, yeah although that's would i be right to assume that's more from the fan reception studies point of view no no okay uh, well i'll have a look and see sure sure <laughs> yeah. okay thank you that's great thank you very much christine that's a great question um does anybody else have a question for either of our speakers can i can i ask one yeah go for it i mean i'm get, i'm having to suppress the urge to just unleash years and years of simpsons appreciation i do actually <laughs> want to ask you a question you about um about aesthetics actually so one of the things that's a kind of cliche i guess of um format and, and the global trade in formats is that you end up with these programs that all look the same but with you know people of different nations in them but the thing that's very striking about your example is how different aesthetically each of those programs look now i know you mentioned very briefly about budget being an issue but is there any other way we might account for how different set design and also styles of presentation um, and editing are in those programs you're mute you're muted you you're <laughs> mute you <laughs> Um, that's actually a very fascinating perspective to look at these matters, but uh, I have to be honest with you, I'm not very familiar with them, the studies on aesthetics, but uh, I would uh, try to read something about it uh, and uh, yes, except about it, I think there are also, um, um, for example, the African host, as we can notice, there are two of them. Actually, if you're following uh, the the uh, the the African social circle social media platforms. You would know that the the female host is a very famous local celebrity. It's like Kim Kardashian in Kenya. So I guess uh, bring her into the program um, is trying to reflect uh, uh, the producers' expectations of how they want to present uh, the program. Yeah, that's definitely a very interesting 
um, point to start into yeah this project. Thank you. And could could you say a little bit more about the the hosting style in in the Chinese version because it did feel a lot more like he's acting as a matchmaker as opposed to mm. a host, but that's only from a very brief exposure. Um, is that a sort of part of that format, and why might it be? Uh, uh, what kind of a specific features that you notice in in the Chinese version that you find is very well? Striking. I mean, obviously, as I say, it was the it was a very brief exposure to it, but it very much yeah. felt like um, the questions being asked were more loaded, perhaps. You mean the question it's um, asked of the participants? Ah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was just um, um, it was. I think I guess yeah, um, China, in China you don't have a lot of public sphere to discuss these kind of things. So the TV program um, um, created this room for people to uh, put on all these kind of social matters on it. Um, that's why the host tend to ask very serious questions. So does the female guest. They want to, you know, I, I, I don't know if you, you're you familiar with the Chinese context. We, in recent years, there was this popular, very catching phrase called uh, positive energy, liang. Like uh, everybody is spreading positive energy because you, know, you want a country to be, you know, stronger, stuff like that. So the host and the female guest and everything they've tried to do is build up these kind of uh, models. So all those kind of questions is around um, that kind of ideology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, Hannah, for your question. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Am I missing anything? And I see no hands. <laughs> and uh, and I, there's nothing striking me from the chat room. So perhaps there aren't any questions. Um, <laughs> I, 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 any more questions? I, I had a just a, a kind of a, an observation, which um, you but more than which is not not so much a question, which is that mm -hmm. um, the the East African program, it's aesthetic, you, which this is one reason why the the um, looking at aesthetics might help, is that the 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 aesthetics of the East African program seem to be a little more raw, you, you know. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's yeah. Something, sure. um, there's something a little rougher about it. So I don't mm -hmm. mean that in an, an evaluative sense, because you know rawness can be very immediate, um, mm. and the and much less managed. You know, mm. the audience appeared to be closer, you know, much closer to the, maybe yeah, that's the, stage. the camera yeah. was, but much closer mm. to the stage. And mm. there's one moment where I thought they might actually stand up and join in. You know, very crammed in. <laughs> yeah. It's mostly men, very possible. I think. Yeah. It's a very male audience, it looked like. Mm -hmm. And perhaps mm -hmm. I, I, I'm just mis misread it, but it looked like mm. a very male audience. So I want this, mm. it creates quite an interesting dynamic really so there's I think there's quite a lot that you can you can get from looking at the different styles and designs and manipulation of space between the different uh, mm. versions yeah. yeah sure yeah thank you no, that's great it's great uh, really interesting um yeah okay I uh, I I, I haven't got any more questions or observations. Does anybody else want to, want to jump in at this point? No? Yeah. OK, um, then please That's let good. me. good, because I hear my baby is crying, so I oh, probably well. have to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's a perfect point. Uh, yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you so well, thank much. Thank you both very much indeed for your, for your papers. They've been really interesting. And uh, I look forward to, to maybe hearing more about the research in due course for both of sure, you. Sure. Thank you, and thank you very much for attending everyone at the tail end of the afternoon. So thank you all. And thanks to Hannah and, uh, and her colleagues um, at Edge Hill for, for, for making this happen. So thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye thank bye. You. So I'm going now.